So I thought it would be appropriate to start today going a little bit further off grid than you might expect. So come with me to Mars. <laughs> I'm Diane McGrath. I'm one of the shortlisted astronaut candidates in the Mars One program. Now the Mars One mission is to establish the first permanent human settlement on Mars. Oh, yes, and it is a one-way trip. So I'm hoping to go rather permanently off the traditional grid. <laughs> but whether that's going to another planet or just getting away from it all for the weekend, we're all wanting to get off grid in some way at the moment. But what is the grid? I see the grid as a framework or a network. It's, it's what connects us and what helps establish some of the structure in our society. And if we think about some of the things that we need to survive in society today, we think about things such as food and energy. Let's look at electricity to start with. In Australia, our electricity grid is made up of a web of poles and wires that run up the east coast of the country, across to South Australia, and under the Bass Strait to Tasmania. And we rely on this web, this network of energy to power the lights in this room today. But what if this grid was broken? Does anyone here remember the Longford gas explosions in the 90s? Yeah? In the state of Victoria, we were without gas to heat our hot water to be able to wash our clothes and <laughs> ourselves for almost 20 days. Now, this hasn't happened in electricity. So in theory, if you're on the grid, you should be fine. But if you happen to live in a remote location in Australia, say outback Queensland, for example, they're not going to run an extension cord from Brisbane to help you out. So a lot of our remote country locations in Australia tend to rely on renewables for their energy, often solar power. On Mars, 100% of our energy will come from solar power. Now, we know that solar power works on Mars. The early Mars Explorer rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, crawled across the red planet for nearly six years, powered entirely with solar energy. We'll be using a thin film, solar photovoltaic, solar PV, <laughs> solar photovoltaic, and we're just going to need a few more of them, say, about 3,000 square metres worth. That looks like eight to nine basketball stadiums. But that should provide us with the energy that we need to be able to survive off-grid on Mars, right? And food. Well, now, food is my personal area of interest. I love food. In Australia, our food grid relies on so many unknown others to grow, distribute, and even sometimes cook our food for us. How reliant are we on this food grid? Let's have a look at the humble asparagus as an example. The Australian Asparagus Council, yes, there is an Asparagus Council. <laughs> the Asparagus Council tells us that 93% of our entire nation's asparagus is grown by about 42 farmers in the regional area in Victoria of Cooirup and Dalmore. 93%. <laughs> That's nuts. Question. What if some of those 42 farmers decides it's time to quit the game? Or what if, like we do in Australia, there's a fire or a flood, and we lose an entire season's crop in one fell swoop. Do you remember paying more than $15 a kilogram for bananas after Cyclone Larry in 2006? Banana bread pretty much disappeared off cafe menus overnight. <laughs> and to eat a banana was a sign of luxury. <laughs> but this is an illustration of our established food grid. It's incredibly difficult to get off the grid for food. 
I actually grew up pretty off-grid, in the outback in the Northern Territory. Now, these were pretty harsh conditions, and we couldn't grow a lot of our own fresh fruit and vegetables. So we used to buy it all in bulk when we'd go to major towns. And sometimes we even would hunt or kill some of our own food, because there wasn't exactly a butcher's next door. So at the age of 11, I learned to shoot, and we ate kangaroo and emu and, and rabbit, because it was our only source of truly fresh meat. On Mars, we'll be growing all of our own food, absolutely everything. Although I reckon I might just prank call Pizza Hut once or twice, just, just to see what they do. <laughs> but seriously, our food system will be entirely indoors using hydroponic systems that we both smart space and energy saving in their technology. Now, carbon dioxide is plentiful on Mars, of course, 92% of the atmosphere. And so, with the right sort of LED lighting, plants are going to be able to photosynthesize as per normal. And water, well, actually, Mars has an ice cap on the northern pole of the planet. And the soil actually has some frozen water in it as well. So we'll be able to tap into that initially to be able to provide the water that we need for ourselves and for the plants and just recycle and recycle and recycle it. And that should provide the food that we need to be able to live off-grid on Mars, right? No, I don't know. I don't think we're actually truly off the grid when we go to Mars. Sure, I can't just flick a switch and, and know that some coal-fired power station is whirring away in the background to provide the light that I need. But we'll have our own electricity grid. It'll just be a lot smaller, completely reliant on solar power, and just a very long way from Earth. And while I won't be able to pop down to the corner store because I've run out of milk, we will have a meticulously planned food system so that we can grow all of the food that we need to survive. So we won't really be off the grid on Mars. We'll just be on a new grid. And while all of these technical aspects of getting off the grid are really interesting, I think, that the greatest challenges that we're going to face are something that we least expect, something that doesn't come to mind first up, and that's the personal stuff. What is your personal grid? What is it that sustains us personally? I believe that the foundation of our personal grid has two key elements. That's resilience and intimacy, with resilience being the primary element. In science, resilient material is able to snap back into shape after it's been challenged or stressed in some way. From the personal perspective, our resilience comes from our inner strength. And it's often through overcoming adversity that we can build our own resilience. But when our resilience is not enough to help us snap back into shape. That's where intimacy steps in. Let me tell you a story. I was in my early 30s, and it was a Sunday morning. In fact, it was around this time of year because it wasn't that long after 9-11. So I was sitting in a friend's kitchen in Sydney, and we were having breakfast. And then my mobile phone rang. So I picked it up, and it was the fire brigade. And the guy on the other end of the line was telling me that he was standing in that burnt-out shell of my apartment back in Melbourne. What do you say to that? What do you do at that moment? I mean, naturally, I, I got on the first plane I could and flew back here to Melbourne, and I remember walking into my apartment and standing there, just surrounded by my blackened possessions. And my world was just irrevocably changed at that moment. In that darkened place, I had no idea how I was going to take the next step forward. 
But many months later, of wearing borrowed clothes and sleeping on friends' sofas, I managed to start again. And in fact, even though the insurance was more than adequate, I ended up not even replacing half of what I'd lost in the fire. Because I'd learned the lesson that, in the end, that was just stuff. And what really mattered were the people in my life. Personal intimacy. Those that were there for me, and those that were not. These personal, intimate relationships helped me snap back into shape, and I think they even reshaped me. They helped me become more resilient. I definitely became a stronger person through this event, and now I have completely lost my reliance and dependence on stuff. In fact, I only live in fully furnished apartments now, and, and I could relocate in a single car load if I had to, but that would mean I'd have to have a car. <laughs> so, when I was faced with a significant challenge, it helped me build my resilience, but intimacy provided the ingredients that I needed when my inner strength was not enough. Without intimacy, Sometimes it can be incredibly difficult to snap back into shape and move forward. Those first four astronauts that go to Mars are going to be tested beyond anything they could possibly dream of. Their resilience, oh, it's going to be challenged. And they will not have access to those personal, intimate relationships in their lives that they lean on. They will be two men and two women from different corners of the globe, different cultural backgrounds. They'll be four strangers, and yet four members of a new family. And I want to be one of them. People often ask me, Di, why do you want to go to Mars? <laughs> I don't think that that's the question that they mean to ask. What I think they're trying to ask me is how can I just go to Mars and leave everything that I love? My friends, my family, my hairdresser, Alison. <laughs> All of those creature comforts that we really do expect and enjoy. I mean, I try and explain it by, by telling them that Mars One, for me, it's ultimate adventure, and it's that chance to live out childhood dreams, and that it's so aligned with my personal philosophies of sustainability. I should probably tell them that I'm not really in the least bit sentimental about stuff. Or I could tell them that I was born the day before Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, and that pivotal moment in history inspired generations. And I would love to be a part of something bigger than me and inspire the next generation of young girls to not just dream of doing something extraordinary, but to make it happen. Or I could tell them that the first McGrath to set foot in this country was a convict on the first fleet. And that no matter how it was that that man came to be in Australia, he still had to leave behind everything that he knew and everyone that he loved to start life again, fresh, here in this hostile new world. For the Mars One astronauts, that new world, it's just going to be a different planet. I still don't think this kind of helps explain why it is that I want to go to Mars. And some of that's because it's just what I feel. I feel it's something that I have to do. For all of the reasons I've just explained, and for so many more that I can't even articulate, but just feel. And I want to take this journey, because every now and then, I need to do something that terrifies me, even just a little bit. Something that challenges me mentally, physically, 
emotionally. Because that's how I take my personal quantum leaps forward. Mars One is my next great leap. Mars One, it's more than just a seven month journey in a tin can with three other people from Earth to Mars. <laughs> Now, Mars One is a journey of my personal development. It's a journey of personal exploration as well as celestial. But why do explorers explore? What was it that drove those guys in the early Middle Ages to jump on those square rig longships and sail away to what was thought to be definitely the edge of a flat Earth? And what is it behind each of us? that makes us take that first breathtaking step in a slightly frightening new direction. I think some of it comes from our sense of personal achievement and satisfaction that we get when we can overcome significant challenges. And by significant, I mean something that the Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield might call something on the edge of possible. And we've been doing this for millennia. It's why we want to go off grid, and I believe it's why we think and know that we can. But getting off grid doesn't come from doing the same mundane thing day in, day out. No. Sometimes we need to go to Mars. Sometimes we need to show that humanity. Can start again, and that we can even unlearn. Sometimes we need to show that we can live in extremely scarce environments and recycle and reuse and reuse absolutely everything that we have. And we can power our lives with 100% renewable energy, and that we can grow everything that we need to survive in a tiny little greenhouse. Some 54.6 million kilometres away. And sometimes we need to scare ourselves just enough so that we can all take our own personal quantum leaps forward. Because this is what inspires us. And I want to invite you to come with me to Mars, because in the end, We're all just ordinary people dreaming of doing something extraordinary. Thank you. <laughs>